Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. You got it? Say, I got it. Yes. You see on the screen, say, I see it. Verse 1, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, he is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. The priests took their positions as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for praising the Lord and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite the Levites, the priests blew their trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing. Solomon consecrated the middle part of the courtyard in front of the temple of the Lord, and there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the fellowship offerings, because the bronze altar he had made could not hold the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat portions. So Solomon observed the festival at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him, a vast assembly, people from Lebo, Hamath, to the Wadi of Egypt. On the eighth day, they held an assembly for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival for seven days more. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal place and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in his mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my, among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name will be there, may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this people? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. I'm tagging the message, if my people, if my people, one of my favorite shows growing up, movies actually, was the movie Aladdin. I don't know if you know that movie. Great, great movie. It's a story of this boy who finds a lamp, and when he rubs the lamp, a genie comes out and gives him three wishes, and he can't ask for more wishes. You get three wishes for anything he wants, and so I used to love that story growing up, and then you become an adult, and you realize that could never happen, and so you're upset about that, but 
Um, why, why in the world would anybody not want to get three wishes for anything they wanted? I would love to get three wishes for anything I wanted. Now, what if I said to you, I will come to you and I'll give you one wish for anything that you want and you will get it. You say, well, that will never happen. Well, it actually did happen because Solomon, as we finish reading about um, his story in, in this particular passage, in chapter 1 of 2 of Chronicles, Solomon is laying in bed and God comes to him and says, ask me for whatever you want. Now, God's never come to me and asked me that question. What, ask me for whatever you want. And what do you think Solomon would ask for? Now, if you were asked that question, what might you ask for? There's a lot of things you might want to ask God for. Something for yourself, something for your family, something for your kids. Maybe bring somebody back who's died. Maybe take somebody out. I don't know what you might want to do. But what would you ask God for? Now, Solomon, he says, I see the people that you want me to lead and it's really, really difficult. So I want you to give me wisdom and I want you to give me knowledge to lead these people. Now, if you were in that room and say, Solomon, you dummy, he said, I'll give you whatever you want. You ask for wisdom and knowledge? Bro, just Google. If, you, if that's a problem, just Google it. <laughs> There's so many things you could ask for. I want wisdom. I want knowledge. You know what, how God responded to him? He said, because you didn't ask for Wealth and riches and honor and the death of your enemies. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you knowledge to lead your people. And then I'm going to give you riches and wealth and honor and, and everything you need on top of that. Amen. On top of that. And the Bible says that Solomon during his reign, he made silver and gold as common as stones in Jerusalem. That's how wealthy he was. And so Solomon, he has in his mind to build a temple for the Lord. His father, David, wanted to build a temple, but God told David, you're not going to be the one to build it. I'm going to have your son Solomon build it. And so you can read this in um, chapters 2 and through 5 in Second Chronicles. But he's writing and he's talking to God about this temple. And as you read about what Solomon put in this temple, it's amazing. If you, if you read, he says that, the insides were layered, overlaid with pure gold. And as you read all the things that were put into the temple, it was a, an amazing, magnificent temple. And so they took some time to, to make the temple, to finish it, and then they furnished it. They brought the things that were uh, consecrated to God and they put in the temple. Then they brought the Ark of the Covenant, and then they were going to have this big party to dedicate the temple to God because God had no place for him to be worshipped. He always had to be carried in the, in the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. And so he said, I need a place where I can meet with my people. So Solomon says, I'll build it. And they, they get to this day where the temple is built, and Solomon stands before the people. He blesses the people. And then in chapter 6, he prays a prayer of dedication and blessing over the people and over the temple. And we'll, we'll look at it in a minute. And then we get to our text, chapter 7. And the whole question is, was God going to look at this temple that they had built for him, and was he going to be pleased with it? Because everybody knows the whole thing is that when you give somebody something, a present, you hope they're pleased with it. You don't want them to open it and go, what is this? <laughs> so God, as they're, they're finishing this, he prays this prayer, and we read it. What happens? Fire comes from heaven, and the glory of God fills the temple. So much the priests, they couldn't do their work. And then you see this over and over in the Old Testament. And the people, they see the glory, they see the fire, and they say, you know, we better get down on our faces because this is amazing. Yeah. And so this is, this is God saying, I have accepted your sacrifices. I have accepted this temple as a place for my name. So then later on that night, actually, according to 1 Kings, Solomon has God appear to him 13 years later. And so what we're reading in chapter 7, in verse, starting in verse 11, actually happened years after the dedication of the temple. And so Solomon has God come to him, and he tells him that I have seen 
the prayers, I have seen the sacrifices. I'm letting you know I am going to be attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place. And this is a question I want to ask for us this morning. How do we know that God will be attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place? How do we know God's going to be attentive to the prayers that are offered in this place? We're going to camp out on verse 14. Verse 14 is the mo- one of the most famous um, passages in the entire Bible. It's the, kind of the center of this book of Second Chronicles, of all the Chronicles. And it's, it's a passage that a lot of people love to put on coffee cups and mugs and on their shirts and like to pray it. But I really want us to get into what, what is God getting at in verse 14 when he says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. What does that mean? And this is the point I'm going to make throughout the sermon. This is my one point. God responds to a humble, prayer-saturated, repentant people. God responds to a humble, prayer-saturated, repentant people. Who is this addressed to? Verse 14 says, if my people. It's interesting, I was reading Ronald Reagan at his inauguration had this verse read. Verse 14 of 2 Chronicles. He wanted... He said, this is what I want to be, sort of the banner over which I lead as president. I want America to be this. And the problem is a lot of people read this verse and they take it as, this is a verse for the United States. Or this is a verse for a nation. This is not a verse for the United States. He says clearly, look at it. If my people, that is a word of ownership. Those who belong to God, those who are called by his name, Those who follow him, not those outside who just kind of like God. He says, if my people and the people he's talking about specifically here are the people of Israel, Mm -hmm. the Jews. He said, well, wait a minute. What about us? I'm a Gentile. Well, in his prayer, Solomon says something very interesting in verse 32 of chapter six. He says, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this temple, then hear from heaven and your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people, Israel. You see the distinction? And may know that this house I have built bears your name. So built into the way God does things, he has a people, his special people, but there was always a place for people who said, I see you, Yahweh, as the one true God. I want to follow you. And and Solomon says, if anybody comes with that heart, God, listen to them as well. So my people, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord is the one that God will listen to. So when he says my people, he's not talking to people out there who don't want to walk with God. He's talking about his people. So he's saying to us this morning, if you, if you're in here and you're a Christian, he's speaking to you. If my people who are called by my name will do three things, and we'll look at that. Number one, they will humble themselves. Humble themselves. Someone who is humble is someone who has reduced themselves. It means to get low or to bow the knee. To lower yourself in terms of rank and in terms of character is to appraise yourself and see you in light of something that's greater than yourself. The longer that you are in something or the more proficient you get at something, we are just prone to drift toward pride. The longer you've been in something, we just sort of drift toward pride. And what ends up happening, the longer you've been at something or you become an expert in something, the tide of pride rises in our hearts until it's just covering everything. And what God is saying is, I I want a people who humble themselves. The, The longer you've been in something, if you've been to the gym in January, you know all the newbies come in who haven't been to the gym in years. And they're looking at all of the equipment, trying to read it and trying to figure out what's going on. They're using the equipment all wrong. And you're just sitting there like, oh, my God, look at these guys. Terrible. 
Or maybe the new person at your job, they don't know all the lingo, they don't know all the terminology. And so you just sort of, you feel like you're, you're a little bit better than them. Just the longer you've been in something, you just sort of, you just drift toward pride. Yeah. Happens spiritually too. You've been in church your whole life. You can finish the preacher's sentences. You've been in church long enough, the pastor starts telling the story, you know exactly what he's going to say. And so now, you've been in church so long, when the, when the preacher gives the, 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 the text, and you're looking over to the person on your right, and they're looking in the table of contents, and you're going, table of contents. He said Genesis chapter 3. What are you looking in the table of contents? And it just happens naturally. Or, yeah, when pastor asks questions, I always know the answer, because I, you know, I study to show myself approved. And, Listen, it just hap- you just naturally drift toward pride. It's not even that you're thinking, I just want to be a prideful person. You just sort of naturally go there. But God says, I'm not looking for people who are overly proud. I'm looking for people who will humble themselves, who will appraise themselves correctly and look, in light of who God is, what am I? Yes. Yes. Now, in Romans, Paul talks about not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. He says to think of yourself, he says, with sober judgment. Sober judgment. And later on, he goes on to say that the reason you should do this is because we are members of one body. And so one part of the body shouldn't be looking at another part of the body and say, you're not as important as I am. I don't care how great you sing. We have a good worship team, right? We got Singers, we got Shantae on the drums, you got me on the keys, you got all the singers. It's great. We got great preachers, don't we? Great pastor. And the pastor and the singers, they get up here and they go, oh, everybody wants to hear my voice, hear my oratory skills and everything. Here's the problem. If the ushers don't open the door, no one's in here. We need everybody in the body. And I can't do everything. I can't be going around doing anything. Now, you guys know the door outside locks at a certain time. And one day during the service, Deacon Allen went outside and he got locked. You guys remember that Sunday? And he came around and he was right here in the window. <laughs> Talking about, hey! <laughs> Open the door! <laughs> now, I could have got down. Oh, let me go down there and go get it. No, that's George, that's Mark, that's Aaron, that's Charlene, that's Etienne. When somebody comes in the door, I'm not handing out everything. We, all, we need each other. It makes no sense for us to believe I'm more important. You say, I'm an I. I'm an I. I see everything. I, I see. God's giving me see. I see. I see. I'm so important. I see. Here's the problem. You can't go anywhere. We're going to go. You're just an I. You can roll places. <laughs> You can't go up steps. Here's what if you if you are just an eye, you cannot do anything but see. And if you are just a hand, you can't do anything but pick up stuff. We need the hands, we need the feet, and so that's why Paul says, "Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, because really, at the end of the day, you're just a hand. You ever see a hand just on the table like this? It's not doing anything. And so." Don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, um, uh, Paul talks about um, thinking about other people better than yourselves. Yeah. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, vain conceit. In humility, consider other people better than yourself. Amen. Think about what is it that makes the person sitting next to you better than you? Because we often think, how am I better than them? If I were to sit down with my wife and she would have named, and I would have named all the things that she is that makes her, that she does better than me, I would have hundreds of things that she does better than me. And if she were to sit down with me and say, list all the things that Shala does better than you, she would have thousands of things. <laughs> okay, to rever- reverse that. But here's what you should do. He says, consider other people better than yourself. So when you are in this church, in the body of Christ, and you're looking at so-and-so, you say, what do they do better than me? 
and not what do I do better than them. Can you imagine a church filled with people all the time saying, oh, man, you're so much better than that than I am. Can you imagine the kind of atmosphere that would set in this church rather than the atmosphere of, oh, man, they don't lift their hands high enough. Or they don't sing good enough. Man, you sing so much better than me. Or, oh, man, you, you, you lead so much better than me. Oh, you're so much of a better teacher. Oh, I love how you're able to pray with people. And we're just constantly encourage, encouraging one another instead of feeling like we're better than other people. He says, consider other people better than yourselves. Amen. And it goes on and on and on. We can keep going. Um, James, in chapter 2, verses 11, he says, um, He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Mm -hmm. Um, Jerry Bridges wrote a book called Respectable Sins. (laughs) It's a book that is written because there are certain sins, he said, that we tolerate. So we, you know, we see it in other people, but we don't, we don't look at our own self. And this is what, this is what. James is saying, he says, if you say, well, look, I I don't commit murder. See, but you do commit adultery. Here's the thing. You are both lawbreakers. So whether you are an adulterer or whether you are a murderer, you both have the same name tag. Lawbreaker. And so you cannot feel you're better than somebody else in the body of Christ because we all come before God as lawbreakers. I used to think, Man, I don't have a testimony. Because I know some of you guys, before Christ, you're crazy. (laughs) And I would hear people in in testimony service, you know. Before Christ, I tried to kill three people. I used to sell drugs, and I was a pimp. (laughs) I got warrants. (laughs) And they just going on and on and on and on. Then it gets to me. And I'm like, my testimony, I, I, I felt I didn't have a testimony. I'm like, well, before Christ, my mom used to tell me to go to bed at 9, and I would go to bed at 10. <laughs> but then Jesus came into my life. And I started going to bed. When she told me, even earlier, well, she told me, you only get one cookie. You only get one cookie. And I took four. But Christ, he picked me up, <laughs> turned me around, told me to put those cookies back. And now I'm walking with the Lord. I don't steal cookies anymore. I go to bed on time. <laughs> Praise God for his grace. I'm a sinner saved by I mean, like, how ridiculous does that sound? That's how I felt when I was in church. Like, man, I ain't never tried to kill nobody. <laughs> Except for Charte a few times. <laughs> But this is what I discovered. I discovered, hey, maybe you tried to kill somebody, or maybe you did. I hope not. But if you tried to kill somebody, if you committed adultery, and all I did was disobey my parents, we're both lawbreakers. So I can't stand and look in judgment against you because we're both lawbreakers. And so none of us have any place to be prideful because we all are in the same position. Now, just one of the areas that, and I'll choose one because there's many, but one of the areas I've seen as an issue when it comes to humility in the body of Christ is the way that we talk about one another. Now, let me just say this. I'm putting myself as the chief offender of this point, okay? But one of the things I've noticed about, and I was sitting with a, another Christian, and we are just talking about various things, and we, we started to talk, and we said, you know, have you ever noticed when you're around Christians that the conversation tends to be very, very negative? And that we're constantly talking about people in the body of Christ who are not doing this, not doing that, or in this sin, or in that sin. Do you even notice, like, that's just a common thing around Christians, and they said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm noticing that. In fact, not a couple years ago, I preached a sermon, and I gave everybody an, a, a, a homework assignment. And I said, for the entire week, you cannot say anything negative about anybody. 
in the body of Christ. Do you know people called me that day, said, we don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> people, <laughs> people were saying, girl, I got to tell you something, but I can't till next week. <laughs> and I'm sitting right there like, I can't believe this. <laughs> but do you realize that's just the air that we breathe in the church? That we're just talking about what other people are doing or not doing. That's just how, how we have conversations. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you another assignment. I don't want you to say anything negative about anybody in the church. Talk about anybody else's sin for the rest of the year. Now, you might be saying, well, because I, I know some of us are, oh, man. I, now, here's, here's what I'm not saying. This is not mean we don't deal with sin in the church. We, we do deal with sin, but to deal with sin in the church, we need to do it biblically. And two ways, they both start with the letter P. Number one, it's dealt with from the pulpit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 and 2, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Then he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage. One of the the ways you know good preaching is if you leave from service upset. (laughs) You should have some Sundays where you're like, I'm I'm moving my membership. (laughs) Because the preacher is just on you. Because you need to be corrected, you need to be rebuked, and the preacher has been given the calling and authority from God to directly deal with sin in the congregation from God's word. So it's not good preaching, you're not in a good church if you never leave like, man, I don't don't like that dude, (laughs) or I don't like that girl. I've had it. There's times I'm like, I'm leaving this church. My dad verbally lambasting me in front of everybody. <laughs> some people, listen, some people have actually left because we've been faithful to teach the Bible. Yeah. We teach, we teach, and we correct, we rebuke, we encourage, we need to make sure we're not just beating people up. But it needs to come from the pulpit. That's the first. But secondly, if we deal with sin in the church, and again, we're still dealing with humility, it needs to be done personally. Here's the, the big difference. When uh, Paul says, if someone is caught in a sin or overtaken in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. And the word he used for restore is a word that would be used to mend nets or to set a bone. To set a bone or to mend nets, you need to be close to it. You need to be in the face of that person or individual. So it needs to be personal. So all what God says, that if you see sin in somebody else's life, you, you go to them personally. And you say, this is what I see in your life. Matthew 18, if someone is in a sin, you go to them. If they repent, you want a brother. If they don't listen, you take two. If they don't listen, you bring it to the church. If they don't listen to them, then you treat them as a tax collector or a pagan. There is a way to deal with sin in the church. The way to deal with sin in the church is not to go to your friend or friends and talk about the sin of somebody else. God never says to do that. Here's a great question. A great question for you to ask. And I got this question from Jesus. And it's going to take courage for you to ask this question. When someone comes up to you and says, I have something to tell you, here's what you ask them. Why are you telling me this? You're going to need courage to ask it. Maybe for the next few months you have more courage. You say, well, we got an assignment to not hear anything negative. Why are you telling me this? And sometimes the things people want to tell you, it's not because they want you to know for good reasons. In fact, recently I said something to someone, and I had to tell them something, and I told them, the reason I'm telling you this is because. I I wasn't going to just, you know, relay information because it was juicy. You know, this is the cultural air that we breathe. Don't you, you ever heard of clickbait? You ever been on the internet, and it says, uh, some, some crazy scandalous title and it makes you want to click on it? That's how we are. We love, we love gossip. We love it. And in fact, this is what our, our covenant says. It says we will not gossip about, about others in the body of Christ. 
So sin, we don't let sin go. We deal with it personally, and we deal, deal with it from the pulpit. And all throughout Scripture, Ahab, he humbled himself, and God didn't bring on him the disaster. Rehoboam, he did not, he humbled himself, and God, his anger turned from him. Over and over and over, we see in the Word of God that when people humble themselves, that God hears. Not only humble ourselves, we must be prayer saturated. Prayer saturated. He says, um, if my people who come by my name will humble themselves and pray. What is prayer? Let me say, what is prayer? Prayer is communion with God. Amen. Communion with God. And so if I were to ask you, what is your spiritual health? I would have to look at your prayer life. Martin Lord Jones, who was one of the great preachers of the last century, said that the true mark of a Christian's health is their prayer life. If you want to know the health of a Christian, you look at their prayer life. And there was a documentary on Martin Lord Jones's life, and it's called Logic on Fire. And Sinclair Ferguson, talking about <clears throat> Martin Lord Jones, said he didn't believe. He's talking about Martin Lord Jones. He said he didn't believe in prayer. He said he believed in God, and therefore he prayed. Because see, what we normally say is prayer changes things, or prayer is powerful. And I know what we mean when we say that. But really, prayer is not powerful. It's God who is powerful. Yes. Muslims pray. Jews pray. Buddhists pray. Atheists pray during a bank robbery. But the issue is they, they don't pray rightly because they don't have the right God. Right. If you don't have the right theology, if you don't rightly see God for who he is, it's not true prayer. Right. So if you want to know, what, how, would I, how would I look at the, the, the spiritual health of a Christian? I would look at their prayer life. How, how often do you pray? How much do you spend time in prayer? But notice that here he says they don't just pray. It also says that they seek my face. This is a word that means to seek the face of God means to come before or to come in front of or to be near. The word for face is interchangeably used with to seek his presence. In fact, there's a passage that says seek his presence continually. It's the same word. So when we are talking about seeking the face of God, it's talking about coming before him, coming before his face. It's the same word that would be used of a person who's seeking an audience with the king. So they want to come before the face of the king. And the way you would know that a king liked you is he would turn his face towards you. If a king would turn his face away from you, it means that he rejected you. And in the scripture, you know, we say make your face shine Upon us, what that comes from is the idea is uh, a person's face shows their joy. It's what's saying God's full of joy, and therefore, when His face shines on us, it means He's blessing us. And he says, "I," he says, "Seek my face. Seek my face." When you're talking to someone, you look at them in the eye, in the face. You don't talk to somebody and look at their elbow. <laughs> you ever seen somebody trying to talk and is looking at their elbow? That's weird. When we talk about the face, when we talk about beauty. We're talking about people's face. We don't say someone's beautiful and we're talking about their legs. We say they have beautiful legs, but you don't say they're beautiful. We talk about the face. If you've ever been married before, you've ever been to a wedding, you know one of the most climactic parts in that whole ceremony is when the woman takes the veil off. And as she's coming down, there's this anticipation for the woman to take off the veil and to reveal the beauty of her face. I remember my wedding and she's coming down the aisle and I'm saying, oh, I want to just see her face. In some weddings now, the women come down and they have the veil off, you know, because they just want everybody to see how beautiful they are before they even get up here. But when they got up there, the person has the veil on and then the, the pastor says something like, you can take off the veil and then you unveil the beauty. Now, how crazy would it be if the husband is standing there And he says, you may not take off the veil. And he says, ah, I'm good. <laughs> what do you mean? You're good? Ah, I've seen it before. <laughs> none, none different. <laughs> or what if they're, they're turned back to back? I mean, that would just seem crazy. Because we want to see the face of the one that we love. So God says, are you, are you seeking 
me? Are you seeking my face? Or do you just want me for what I can give to you? If you won the lottery tomorrow, how would your social life change? You would have all kinds of friends you had never seen before in your life. I got a buddy who's rich, and he said people, they come to him all the time. Hit him up. He doesn't know how they get his number. Hey, man, how are you? I'm good. Who are you? Oh, man, it's Jimmy. Jimmy. All right, Jimmy who? Man, we had Spanish together in ninth grade. You remember? I, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you sat in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, man, I got this business venture I want to bring to you. Now, here's the thing. Um, you know my brother, he plays basketball, plays professional basketball, makes good money. Can I tell you that I don't call him or talk to him or text him to get things from him? I don't, that's not, you're my brother. I just, I just want to see how you're doing. I just want to be friends with you. Yeah, you could buy me stuff and if you want to, go ahead, but... That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to know you. And I fear that we come into God's presence too often and we look at him and we look not to his face and all that he is, but we look at the treasury sitting behind him. Say, Lord, you know, you're great and everything, but I would love some gold coins to put in my bag as I leave. And God is saying, I want you to seek my face. Seek my face. God knows that you have needs. He knows that you have needs, and so he calls you to pray and to ask him for whatever you want, and he will give it to you. He knows what you need. Prayer, remember, prayer is communion. Prayer is not just about getting what you want. And as we come to him as a church, we're not just coming to God to get stuff from him. We're coming to gaze upon his beauty, to know him, to be with him. It's interesting, he says, seek the face of God, which, again, means to come before, which means it's different than, you know, the fact that God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time. We don't, God doesn't just say, well, I'm everywhere at the same time. You're, you're there with me. He, no, he says, I want you to seek my face, which means there's a way to seek God that is different than the fact that he's just everywhere. In fact, in the, in the scriptures, sometimes God would localize his presence in such a way that we'd be able to see his glory. Now, nobody can see God and live. He always veiled it. He always put a filter on so it would kill us if we saw his, his glory in all that it was. But Moses, he's on the mountain with God. His face is shining. Jesus, he's transfigured and he's shining. The, the, the glory and the brilliance of God cannot be seen. We cannot see God and live. However, we can look into the face of Jesus in our time of worship, in our time of prayer, and time in the word. He said, I want you to seek my face, pray and seek my face. And as we as a church, we've been praying, we've been calling out to God for revival, for change in our church, change in our community. Listen, know that we must persevere in prayer Amen. and persevere in seeking his face. Yes. Amen. In his book on prayer, Tim Keller read a, an illustration that is just so good, so powerful. He, there's a man who was talking about when they make mines. Let me just read to you what what he said. He said, this mining as they knew it in Norway in the early 20th century, demolition, (coughs) demolition to create mine shafts took two basic kinds of action. There were long periods of time, he writes, when the deep holes are being bored with great effort into the hard rock. To bore the holes deeply enough into the most strategic spots for removing the main body of rock was work. That took patience and steadiness and a great deal of skill. Once the holes were finished, however, the shot was inserted and connected to a fuse. You have this picture, they're drilling down into a, a, a rock to make room for this shot to throw down. So this shot was inserted and connected to a fuse. To light the fuse and fire the shot is not only easy, but also very interesting. One sees results 
Shots resound, the pieces fly in every direction. He concludes that while the more painstaking work requires both skill and patient strength and character, anyone can light a fuse. This helpful illustration warns us against doing only fuse lighting prayers. The kind that we soon drop if we don't get immediate results. Because as Christians, we don't believe just in the power of prayer, but we also believe in the wisdom of God. And so he says, if we believe in both the power of prayer and the wisdom of God, we will have a patient prayer life of whole, boring prayers. Why is it we pray 99 times for this and it seems like nothing has happened and then on the, ninth, on the 100th time a fuse is lit and revival breaks out. But where did it start? It started with that whole boring prayer. It started with us going deep into the rock. Going deep into the hard places. And then one day we'll pray and this place will be filled. People will start coming. But it's going to be those who pray those patient, whole boring prayers. Let's not give up praying because we may not see the results that we think we should see. we got to be patient and continue to bore down. Lastly, he says, I want you to turn from your wicked ways. Humble yourselves, pray, seek my face. And he says, turn from your wicked ways. The word ways is a word that means road or course, or distance, and it's a word that comes to mean lifestyle. When you're talking about turn from your wicked ways, he's not, what we do oftentimes, we just talk about individual and particular sins, but we don't often talk about the course that we're on. We don't talk about the, the lifestyle. When you're in church, I heard, heard this prayed all the time, God, forgive me for not spending enough time with you. Great, great thing to pray. But if you were to ask that person the next day, hey, what have you done so that you are able to spend more time with God? Oftentimes they'll look at you blankly. Because for many of us, all we want to do is just pray the prayer of confession. Just confess it. But you actually have to do things to change. That's what repent means. It means to turn, to change your mind, and to go another direction. So if you say, God, I want to spend more time with you, that means you got to watch, watch less Netflix. I know every seems like every month they got a new series that you can watch. You can spend hours just sitting there watching it. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I watched Luke Cage in two days. But I'm just saying that there is a way for us to repent or to just simply confess sins without actually turning from the way. So what are you doing to actually make sure that the sins that you're committing and the things you're confessing before God, you don't commit again? I'll give you an example from my own life. I give Mondays to my family as a family day. And on this day, I also at night, 637, play basketball. And so we do our stuff during the day. And then around 6 or 630, I start getting ready for basketball. And the wife would say, oh, you're going to basketball? I said, yeah, that's what I do. And she says, you don't want to spend the whole day with us? And I said, no. <laughs> I want to play basketball. <laughs> and then I'd be in church. Oh, God, make me a better husband. I want to spend more time with my family, and I want to spend more time with my son. Then Monday comes, and I'm like, I'm going to play basketball. I'm going to not do that. You ever been spanked by the Lord? <laughs> he convicted me. He said, well, you, you're praying to spend more time with your family and your kids and have a better relationship with them, and yet you won't give up basketball? So you don't come to me praying, oh, God, forgive me, and then you won't do practical things to make sure you don't fall into those same sins. He says, don't just confess your sins, but turn from your wicked ways, from your wicked paths. So what does this mean for us? What does it mean for us? It means, simply, we must be a humble, prayer-saturated, repentant, 
people, if we want God to listen to the prayers offered in this place. You know what's interesting? He says, I will be attentive and my ears will be open to the prayers offered in this place. He didn't say the preaching. He didn't say the service. He says, my house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. What is God's ears tuned to? It's tuned to the prayers of his people. I think that's what we need to be. But over and above that, we need to rejoice in the gospel. The reason I say we need to rejoice in the gospel, this is so good, and we're almost done. We need to rejoice in the gospel because as you read this story, if you know your Bible, you know what Solomon, and I, let me just say, let me encourage you to read Solomon's prayer because what, how God responds to Solomon in chapter 7 is he's responding to specific things that Solomon prayed. So he's using the same phrases and he's using the same words in order to respond to him. But you know in Deuteronomy 28, God lays before the people two things, blessings and curses. And it was very simple. He said, if you obey me, I will bless you. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed when you come, when you go. Your fruit will be blessed. Your kids will be blessed. Everything you touch will be blessed. All you got to do is obey me. Simple. But if you don't obey me, there are curses. So you'd be cursing the city, you'd be cursing the field. You imagine singing that in church? <laughs> We're cursed in the city. It's terrible. And all you got to do, he said, is if you disobey me, and it's, read it, Deuteronomy 28, the list of curses is crazy. It's longer than the blessings. And he's saying, I'm going to send plagues and pestilence. You're going to get married and your wife's going to get stolen from you. I mean, it's crazy. But you see, as you read Solomon's prayer, you see that's what's influencing the way that he prays. Because all throughout the Old Testament, God responds to his people when they sin against him. And he sends things against them in order to turn them back to him. And so when Solomon's praying and he says, we, if we sin against you, we need you to relent. We need you to forgive us of our sins. If we turn away from our sins, if we pray, we humble ourselves, please turn from your sin. But in reading that, I don't find any kind of comfort. You know why? Because I know my heart. I know my pull towards sin. And so I don't, I don't find any comfort in that. And you shouldn't either. But there's a great passage in Galatians chapter 3 that is so powerful. I'm just going to read it to you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Now, remember, he says, I lay before you blessings and cursings. If you obey me, there's blessing. If you disobey me, there's cursings. Listen to what Paul says about Christ. He says, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This is the great and glorious gospel because I don't care how hard you try, you cannot be obedient to God the way he calls you to be obedient to him. And do you remember at the end of 2 Chronicles, it says that if they did not obey God and if they walked away from him, that the temple would be destroyed and that people would walk by and say, see, God has abandoned them. God doesn't like them. It would become a byword. It would become a disgrace. And they would walk by and point it and make fun of it. You notice that outside the city of Jerusalem, Jesus is on the cross and people are walking by saying, "Look, look at him. He's under God's curse. God is not pleased with him. God does not like him. Why? He must be a sinner. He must be an evil man. Because only an evil man would be on a cross. Listen, that they did not know is that Christ on the cross was bearing my curse. He was bearing your curse. And it gets better than that. He bears our curse, and through his death and his resurrection, he then dispenses the blessings of God to us. So the Old Testament law that says there's blessing and then there's cursing, God takes on the curse and then he dispenses the blessing to us, the blessing of Abraham. God says of Abraham, he believed God 
and it was credited to him as righteousness. All those who come to Christ, who believe and trust in him, the curse of the law is put on Christ, and we get the blessing of God. And so I don't have to fear to be cursed because Christ was cursed in my place. In verse 10, he says, all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Everyone who tries to do what's right in the book of the law is cursed. Why? Because all the Old Testament sacrifices, and Hebrews tells us this, all the Old Testament sacrifices were really, they were not adequate to deal with sin. They could not deal with the guilt of the sinner. They were just sort of like a band-aid until Christ came. They, they call it, it was an advanced announcement of the gospel. That before Christ came, he said, there's coming a lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, who will be sacrificed once for all. And so as you and I stand before God today, we know he bore our curse. All the curses of the law are put on him, and we get the blessings of God, the promise of the Spirit, and we can now walk with him. Listen, Dr. Russell Moore said, the worst thing that could happen to you is not that you get cancer. The worst thing that can happen to you is not that you lose your job. The worst thing that can happen to you is not that you get a divorce. The worst thing that can happen to you is not that your car breaks down. He says the worst thing that can happen to you, Christian, the worst thing that can happen to you has already happened. Because the worst thing that could happen to you is to come under the wrath of a holy God. And Christ on the cross, for all those who would believe, will take that curse, put it on himself, and give us blessing. Amen. Let's pray.